it sorted. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yep. Okay, so we'll we will reconvene the meeting, and we are now on the uh, water security management plan. This is this business case is on page thirty nine, and yes, maybe three three ninety three ninety, which is quite good. Um, um, if I can just say all those comments that were made for the last business case, it stopped abruptly after year two and how we message, as you said, Madam Chair, that these are all, you know, these foundational documents that are going to inform the future. We will take into account for the business cases that do have that fixed term. Um, this is one councillors, again, have uh, seen, well, the summary of it, feedback back. Um, it's, again, very much speaking to us. Janine pointed out the resilience of the region going forward. Um, we are at the women fancy of Mother Nature. This summer looked markedly different to last summer and who knows what next will be. But hopefully the work that we've done with the uh, water security strategy that we endorsed by Council June last year, this is the next iteration of that. Thomas, is there anything you wanted to particularly highlight? Water security plan. Yep. Um, so in the latest updates, <clears throat> we've added a lot more detail around how this might actually roll out, how this might proceed over the next few years. That basic detail was lacking in the original draft, so hopefully that's cleared up some of the uncertainty. Adam Chair, if I can just make the point again, this is captured in our performance measures under the SPY goer and all of these that we're talking about, the scope and the definition, the issue definition will come back through either council or a committee of council. So councillors can um, put in their input. Great. All right. Any questions? <laughs> Councillor Smith lighting a fire over there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the ambition. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead, Tracy. Anything else? No, nope. we're all good. We're all good. No other questions. Okay. Again, this one is funded through the prior year surplus, right? Yes. Okay. Uh -oh. Yeah, the question. Oh, yes, Jennifer. The the ambitious options seem to go in like a whole nother direction with talking about major infrastructure and stuff. What what kind of uh, prompted that? It seemed like quite a jump. Yeah, it's, it's a bit similar to the conversation around Funga Marino, you know, all the things you could do. And and I know for uh, in, in some other cases, councils have gone ahead with um, more big thinking options. So we're just flagging that as you know that's that's a realistic option that some uh, councils and organisations have followed. Diving into large infrastructure, big dams and things like that. Boys. Again, where the B word comes up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, like until New Zealand sorts out its whole infrastructure funding system, I wouldn't want to touch it with a barge pole. Um, and also some of the commentary in there. I put some notes next to to say, you know providing more supply um, when New Zealand and Waikato are even hugely wasteful with water, um, you would almost be taking away the um, incentive, well, you would be taking away the incentive for reduce and um, be more efficient and all that stuff. So I think we're still in that part of the journey as a community. Um, but just in general, uh, Sorry, there's a lot of notes on here. <laughs> I think if we were talking about resilience, um, having one big water storage thing is something I'd shy away from. I'm much more of a believer in decentralized water storage, decentralized energy and so forth. So, and when it comes to resilience and big extreme weather events and that kind of thing. So um, the ambitious option I was 
definitely going away from. So happy with the preferred option as it's there. Thank you. Great. All right. If there's oh, you're looking quizzically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Councillor um, Hodge. What's he saying? Thomas. Thomas. Um, just off the cuff, and I'm not sure. I tried to find it in this, but. What a security management plan does that include, or will it include looking at farmers or people being able to have storage of water on their lands without damming up the waterways? Because I guess I was asked that question from a bloody minister, to be honest, around whether Waikato <laughs> Regional Council was going to look at approving water storages like that for for our people in Waikato. Does that is that included in this? Yeah, I, I think. In developing this plan, it's about looking at, at all the options, including, like you say, how can you uh, hold hold the water where you need it for longer? Is Does that look like a dam? Does it look, look like your soil management? Is it your flood management? Uh, is it your use? Um, urban, electricity, you know, the uh, rural, all, all of these uses interact. It's pretty hard to separate them for the Waikato. Like, yeah, um, is, is this going to what they have already achieved? Would there be an enhancement from this new plan to allow them to continue what they're doing? Uh, I, I think a lot of that is driven by you know the rules and policy that we have in our regional plan, changes to the regional plan might flow from this project and looking at what some good options are. Yeah, so yes, but separated by a few steps potentially from this particular business case. So it's driven by the options that are currently available in our regional plan. Is there, uh, is there intent to explore any changes that could be suggested to that regional plan to enable uh, whatever is the best case scenario? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, we, we, we need to scope up the uh, to limit the project because it could potentially be quite huge, right? Mm -hmm. Separating out how we revisiting now, you know, how we allocate water and things like that, or are we limiting it to how we use the water afterwards? And the rules around that. There's also the more the emergency response, right? When you're moving beyond normal water security to extreme events, all those are uh, on on the table for the scope of this project, and and we'll need to refine that down to something manageable, uh, and and bring that back to you. Okay, I've got Councillor Cookson, and then I have Councillor Marr, and then Councillor Smith. Councillor Cookson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, would the scope include <clears throat> regeneration of aquifer? Yeah, I don't see it as out of scope at this point. Because um, we can always store water on the ground, but it's going to go stagnant and horrible anyway. It's not going to be that good for drinking. Where if we're actually using water short term and catching it in a in a catchment facility and then regenerating it and putting it back in the aquifer sounds a pretty Pretty good idea instead of um, storing water above ground for no reason. Um, it's definitely going to have a better life 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 force when it's down there filtering itself and getting back to its purity. Uh, makes sense to me. Less evaporation and less heating as well. Mm. Councillor Mark. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Thomas here, sorry, and I missed the beginning of this, but um, uh, what's the rationale behind using an external contractor? Do we not have capability in house? Uh, yeah, it was the, the limits on the staff we have, and and the concern that if it was added to somebody's job that's already full, that it wouldn't happen. So, making sure it happens by having somebody who's dedicated to uh, driving the project. And, and that's not that's not a vacancy that we're looking to fill within council. I know we have. Jobs uh, advertised, etc., and would be a would be a contracted uh, uh, services 
so we'd be engaging a, a, a consultant yeah. yep, rather than rather than a uh, looking, temporary or, or, or permanent staff member. Looking mindful, Tracy, did you want to add something? Uh, sorry, Madam Chair, <laughs> I was just going to say at the moment, uh, the directorate's covering, I think, two or three vacancies. So we don't have a high turnover rate. We haven't had a high turnover rate in science um, for the last three to four years. And when we do, we're managing to get people uh, into seats very quickly, which is not at all like it was um, six, seven years ago where we had long lead-in times. Um, exactly what Thomas said, we have, we've got our, our freshwater review, we've got um, resource use, Brent crying out for more resource if possible from internal staff to assist with consent. So exactly what Thomas said, if we didn't have anyone specifically dedicated to this, uh, at the moment we have framed it up as a contractor. Could be that it's a, an FTE solely dedicated to this, but we believe that, that the contractor is the way to go. Uh, just their reach might be further than, than an FTEs. But at the moment, if we added it on to somebody's job, it wouldn't get done. Thank you. Councillor Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> this is an issue that the Waikato District has been confronting for some time and, and talked about, but always put off because of the cost um, and trying to get all the interested parties together. So absolutely support this. And I just, <clears throat> for example, you've got up at, um, oh, Maramaru, you've got the coal mines in Kaupua 1 and 2. I did a, um, a uh, resource consent hearing to consent the um, the take of the coal up there. Um, and the idea there was to, once they were mined out, was to knock the um, the walls of the lakes down and, and create a giant recreational lake, but it also opened the opportunity for water storage and water use. Um, likewise, uh, I know Waikato Tainu Tainu has got the um, the huge uh, cavities out at uh, Rotawara, which are incredibly deep and huge, and I don't know what their aspirations are, but that was always talked about with Waikato District as being a water resource that could be fed into the river um, for takes further up to benefit the people of the Waikato rather than Auckland. Um, so, but you know, I, nice I think, little add on there. <laughs> yeah. But I, I do think there are opportunities that we need to finally get on and sort out, um, certainly for the benefit of the Waikato. Thank you. And I suppose that this work would include those broader conversations, like you're talking about, ensuring that we're we're liaising with with other stakeholders that that might be able to. Yeah, I, I think two years, um, the resources available, I think, will realistically restrict. We won't be able to talk to everyone or engage all the people with an interest in water and probably have to focus on um, some some key stakeholders. And, and that bothers me, Madam Chair, unless, mm. we, unless we're going to do it properly, do everybody, it? what's the point of doing it if we're going to do to use the word half-assed, if I'm mm. allowed to say that, um, let's do it properly. And if we, well, it, or is the question if we wanted to be, if if we collectively view this as a significant area of work that we want to make some considered progress in, because we have been talking about this for, well, the two trienniums that I've been involved, and in, I'm I'm guessing it's gone back even further than that. So if we wanted to make further progress, is this ambitious enough? If not, how could we be more ambitious? Yeah, I think we could, um, you know, we can make progress for a fair chunk of the region. You know, we have existing plans, policy, rules in place for managing um, how we use water, who has access to the water. There's a lot of, a lot of systems already in place. So this is, the water security topic is is part of that broader water allocation and use conversation, and we have put a lot of a lot of time more broadly into um, mm. into that water allocation issue. So, so I think we can progress a piece of the puzzle, if you like, which, which is the way I see water security. It is. It's, so, it's so the well, around the table is is just a piece of the puzzle, adequate for. I've lost your red light there. Yeah, Sorry. 
Serena uh, uh, alluded to it earlier, is, you know, we waste a lot of water. I think Jennifer even mentioned it. We, we let opportunities go by. It's about the capturing of it before we even get to the allocation of it. Mm -hmm. So are we taking the opportunities to retain yeah, it for later use in a way that is economic and environmentally sound? So I'm not interested in allocating it. It's a matter of getting it so that we can allocate it. So unless that's part of the conversation, I'm not interested in it. Um, if I can just help, so, um, you know, we've had a previous piece of work done which showed what does the future look like, which talked about it getting wetter in the south and the west and drier in the north and the east sort of thing. Um, we know that, you know, there's a whole 10% of the water that flows out of the Waikato River at the mouth comes from a, a different region and catchment altogether, you know, it's, um, which could change in the future. Um, there's a lot of there's been a lot of discussion mercury led about how water is managed uh, in part of our region, not the whole region. And I think um, at the moment we're getting a strategy done by experts who have done it in Queensland. I think Thomas, um, that strategy is going to land, and that's going to help inform the plan. And then the the plan will be putting that all together. So what do we need to have in place so we can manage water for the long term in the Waikato region? Um, I, I think I'd take your point that we can't talk with anyone and everyone, everybody, but I think the idea is that we, you, you are going to be talking with all the main players who, who would have an interest in, in water um, management under Waikato. Hmm. Yeah, councillors, again, um, we're not starting from scratch. This is the, the third in a series of documents. So we've made significant investment to date and getting the strategy together, the implementation plan, this is the first step of that. It is 380,000, which isn't insignificant. I mean, when we say we won't talk mm. to everybody, Thomas is right, we won't talk to everybody, but we'll talk to the main players. Mm. Um, okay. I just wanted to pick up, um, Chris has alluded to um, the Whanganui River. So Te Hiki Ngahuru, which is the uh, Te Turi mana equivalent for uh, the river has just closed. Those submissions are just closing. We don't know what will come of that. That will go through a process next year. So that is something to fold into uh, this. For me, $380,000 over two years is a significant amount of investment based on work we've already got. As Thomas said, that is quite comprehensive and the strategy work we've already got. So from me, looking at it and this wasn't the first bid from the team, to be fair. Um, but, you know, the other thing is we've got to scope it up and put it through a, a project plan. Um, I think we will um, hit all the high points that we need to to give you the information to go forward. But again, taking on board the comments, this won't stop after year two. Mm. You know, there will be yeah. work programmes that the outputs will be factored into. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Hodge, did you have you hit your light there? It was about um, it was about where do we sit as a council and with our TLAs around um, tanks. Cause I remember uh, last year during that drought, you know, Waipai District Council went out to try and entice the people to put up water tanks for storage, but but you know the weather's changed and and they've let it go. But you know, with with the the population growing and Waikato River having a very limited amount of, of, of water level now, no matter what they let out of Taupo, where, where can we sit as a council to ensure that our TLAs are looking at their new bills with tank storage tanks being attached to their houses somehow, so through, even if it's only for, you know, washing their cars, stuff like that? Through you, Madam Chair, we already have provisions in our regional policy statement, which was operative in 2016, asking our TLAs to implement these measures. We submit on each district plan, um, and we haven't had uptake from our TLAs on that because generally the times we submit on district plans, there's an abundance of water in the system. Mm. So it is something that we will look at as part of our freshwater policy review whether we need tighter measures. Um, we also know um, that politically putting in water meters is a tough decision, and we've come up against that previously as well. Um, we've had, we did a let's talk water 
um, campaign in 2016, I think, which actually had some good information in there. As soon as you meter water, people's uh, ability to use it and their behaviours change pretty quickly. So we have the tools, they're not taken up. It's something we need to look at. So the allocation of water then, um, how often do we actually look at municipal intake, uh, outtake of allocation of water? Maybe in that review is where we might consider saying, uh, it's time for you guys to look at another picture instead of us always giving them that higher, 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 because in Waikato, the majority of it comes down to that river, out of that Waikato River. If we don't do something soon, there won't be any water left in that bloody river. So, hey, that's what I'm talking about, eh? Gauntlet. Gauntlet laid there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any, yes? yes, my point was that we talk about allocation, but the reality is we need to be storing water so that we can use it later through the allocation yep. process. Yes. So unless that's part of this, yeah. um, it's, we're not doing the whole job. Yep. I'm um, assured that it is. Yep, and through you, Madam Chair, I mean, you will see that there are a number, I hate to think what the Venn diagram looks like, but a number of these business cases that overlap you know, um, particularly biodiversity, biosecurity that we're talking to, uh, the when we look at our infrastructure strategy, just the whole way we use our catchment is something, the spatial uh, strategy is something we're going to have to look at. Um, and as uh, Councillor Cookson said, you know, not default to keeping the water on the land, it might be putting it back into it. Mm. Councillor Cookson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and it's a bit of rut as well, but anyway, um, I've, I've brought it to council a couple of times now that basically every dairy farm in the Waikato uses around between 30 and 80,000 litres a day just to wash dairy effluent off concrete yards. And I don't know how many, how many dairy farms are there in the Waikato region there, Tracy? 10,000. So you're talking about that we need we, we need to look at that the a, a plate, the farmers are with a scale that it's affordable to do and it would be it also gives them extra storage for the effluent. These are the things we should talk, be talking about because that gives all that extra water to the communities to be able to use that isn't being contaminated and going down drains or running off land. It's actually just staying within a, a cycle. So uh, I don't, there's, these so are things that need to be included in these, and that will that will change the whole way we do things. And it's going to take a ten years to get it to happen, but it needs to start happening. Some of us dairy farmers have been doing that for quite some time, <laughs> and there's a lot that aren't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we need to to. Um, you, you I look suppose, at, like you say, uh, in terms of, of I'm looking for rent out uh, here. Just uh, those those conversations with our dairy farmer partners here in in the region, just illustrating what are some of those other choices that could be made. It's a million. It's it's millions of liters of water that are got not going back into, um, either that are getting to go into natural waterways, or not being used to filter on land then to go into waterways or you just do a controlled system where that effluent just keeps going around and cleaning so you know there's a whole lot of different benefits from it i brought it all back right. i brought it to you nine months ago yeah. now tracy all right anything else on this no okay so next we have uh this is on page 40 the biodiversity biosecurity this is on Page 40 and page 411. And Madam Chair, I will pass over to Greg for this one and just look about on the fringe. Fringe. Fringe, Tracy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, 
and yeah, so for this uh, particular business case, I'm joined by Patrick Whaley as well. Um, and I think Michelle was online a minute ago. I'm not sure if she's still there. Just looking at the list. Can't see her, but both Patrick and Michelle have been at the forefront of preparing the business case that you see before you today. So we have a business case that straddles both the biodiversity and the biosecurity activities. Um, and it is a, a, a basic case that has been presented to you today and recommended as far as the budgeting goes. Um, the, the biosecurity aspect of the case includes um, a number of elements where we have uh, existing partnership agreements in place um, and a need for us to continue to build those and meet our, um, our responsibilities with our partners. And a great example of that is in the marine biosecurity space where we are working on the clean hull plan with the top of the North Councils. Um, there are several other areas where we need to maintain the gains um, that we have made over the years um, with, again, with our partners in biosecurity. Um, and examples of those include the Cody Protection Program in Walden Pines. Um, and likewise, there are some areas that we need to do more. Um, and a great example is, is in the plant pest area um, where we know more about um, one of our more prolific plant um, pests being alligator weed um, and the need to invest a great deal more. Um, a more detailed breakdown of this business case is provided for you in page 429 um, of the document that you have, um, and you will appreciate that there are a number of different elements um, to this particular business case. On the biodiversity front, um, there are a couple of couple of areas of focus. One is around the Natural Heritage Partnership Program, um, and so that's been a topic of – oh, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. I was referring to later on. Yep, so the business case starts at 411, but there is a colourful breakdown um, of the business case from 429 onwards. Um, from the Natural Heritage Partnership Program, I guess this has been a subject of, of quite a range of discussions in, in recent months. A lot of acknowledgement that the fund is, is struggling to keep pace with the demand that we see out in the community. Um, we already see that by the oversubscription to the various funds under this umbrella. Um, but in saying that, uh, the recent review also identified a need to consider how we actually use that fund. Um, to, to best effect um, identifying areas such as um, collective impact. Um, and so you'll see a comment in the report here noting that staff in parallel to this process are working on a review um, to the current uh, policy that under underpins how we use the Natural Heritage Partnership Program. And we'll be expecting that to bring back, we'll be expecting to bring that back to Council um, in due course. In the meantime, fundamentally, we do have a short shortage um, as far as um, the demand that's out there in the community, and we're only we are only expecting to see that get worse um, as other yep. areas of funding that community groups have benefited from over the last few years start to go offline. Uh, and again, um, that same breakdown of 429 provides that colourful breakdown in the biodiversity front. Um, we've also identified the need for further investment in tier one biodiversity monitoring um, to understand where we're at at, at a regional scale. Um, I guess fundamental to a lot of this business case is the fact that we know we are still losing more than we're gaining um, as far as the efforts that we're making in this space. Um, and it's important that we do um, further work to um, better understand what that is and demonstrate, I guess, the gains that we are making um, as Council invests into this area. So, Madam Chair, said it is quite a complex business case, and that is a real, real thumbnail dis um, description of, of what's in there. Um, a lot of detail to go through, um, and mm. I wonder if it would be best to throw open for questions or discussion. Councillor Nickel. Thanks. Hi, Greg. Always losing more than we're gaining. I have to say we see a basic, a better, and I was looking for that next one. I really was, because how much longer do we just lose the stuff that we can't get back? Um, and I'm really worried about biosecurity in particular um, with those new things coming in. I don't understand, and this is my question, but I have other things later, why we put why in this uh, budget we put the basic in when the preferred option is the better, because it really confused me. The preferred option is always the one that is budget put into that proposed budget from what I could tell. It just didn't allow that same kind of scrutiny, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Sure. Um, the rec sorry, it's a bit of confusion. So the recommended option is the basic? 
option that's been put forward, um, and that's why it's been included in the budgeting. Um, and I guess that's been put together through taking a look at the program um, really tough, really toughly, and actually having a look at um, what are our priorities, um, what are what are the alternatives that we can use to try and achieve the same outcomes? Um, are there opportunities to potentially um, change the scope or change the pace of our investment, um, but ultimately um, an attempt to move in that direction that's desired, um, whilst also acknowledging the fact that you know there is a big investment that's been called for in this business case. Okay. So looking to provide that balance against it's, outcomes. I understand. It's just in the executive summary under economic case, quite far down the, it says we present three options. While the preferred option is the better option, as it will meet the needs of the critical success elements above, only the basic option has been budgeted for. It should be noted the better option has a mix of improved business as usual as well as some new projects. So which one is correct, the document or what you just said? What I've just said. Okay, so the preferred option is the basic option. Okay. Just gets me more grumpy. Maybe somebody else wants to talk. So the preferred option from staff is the basic one. Not the better. Can I can I just understand that? Why why basic and not better? Were you were you was it yeah. mainly affordability or were there other things yeah, that it was. Um, so there was a number of areas of investment that were called for. Um, we had to assess that um, and make a call and um, finding the right balance, I suppose, between demand mm -hmm. and cost. Um, and we feel that we've landed in a, um, in a good space with what's put forward here. Yeah. Um, Councillors, I think that uh, when considering the overall LTP budgets and, and the number of staff uh, requests into the organisation, there's probably, um, as an executive, we're quite, quite tough on a lot of the business cases. And I think that we've probably con um, contributed to um, the basic option. Um, I think that we've had the assurances that it will step us in the right direction, but it's all a scale at how quickly we go in that direction. So it's probably that, as I said right at the start, that that balance has been caught by one of those balances between um, affordability and, and, and moving forward. All right, I've got Councillor Downard, did you still want to speak? Okay, just, just uh, I've got Councillor Downard, Councillor Clarkson, Kneebone, and then Nicole again. Thanks, Greg, and, and the team. Obviously, through the workshops, biosecurity was a high priority with most councillors. So, my only um, question is, is, is there's a lot of crossover between central agencies and, and ourselves. How much do we take on more at an extra cost to us? And, and you know, when's that call made? You know, for an example, the clams, you know, MPI were a bit slow. Did that did that create extra cost for us? Or, you know, um, you know, is it through DOC and and um, the Wallaby and and stuff like that? So how much do we have a pushback on these central agencies or they push on us to take on more? That's my only can concern. And I think we all, as councillors, agree that by both of these have, have, have been uh, left behind over the last few years, and we need to, you know, spend money on on this area. But yeah, that's the only thing that I've got to ask. Any comment? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, look, that's a good question, and I think through most of these partnership programs, we were really hard to have clear roles and responsibilities between what. Uh, central government does, and and a lot of these programs that that involves, you know central leadership if they're coordinating a wide range of stakeholders and uh, numerous regional councils. Um, they can provide some baseline funding. Um, where, where they tend to, so that's their, their kind of role and where, where they've learned is that we're better operationally. So we often, often operationalize these programs. We've got people on the ground, um, and but we're trying to always make sure that we're not doing their job and also they're not kind of standing in and doing our job as well. Councillor Clarkson. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I can't see the logic uh, at all. And you would expect me to say that, wouldn't you, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you've, you've built a preamble and an introduction to a document which makes this case for serious decline 
And then you're telling us that you believe that the basic option is the right selection. Well, I can't buy it, I'm sorry. Um, I also think we've got a massive credibility problem here because some of the elements that you... Let, let's start with biosecurity. Yes, of course, central government has a role, but of course, regional and district and local government all have a role. Biosecurity is not something that just emanates from Wellington. It's actually about the region we live in and what we do about it. Um, and you know what? The current government is going to cut all budgets centrally by approximately 7%, 7.5%. So if you're waiting for them to deliver, you're going to be waiting even longer. So, um, yeah, I just don't buy it. I think it's an undersell. I think it doesn't bring the community with us. And I think that's another aspect of it I'd like investigated is how are we asking as part of the LTP process about what people actually want and need? And I don't see much evidence of that. And when you line yourself up and say stuff like, oh, collective impact, we're not going to fund it. Boy, have you got a credibility problem now? been working on this topic for at least three and a half years that I recall, and the meetings were instigated by this regional council. And now you're coming along and saying, oh, no, we're going to drop it. We're just going to drop it dead. That's not credible, I'm sorry. I would be wanting some further work to be done. And, and when you say this was a collective decision within the organisation, I'm assuming you're referring to... Are you referring to the biodiversity advisory group or are we talking about um, the executive leadership team? I mean, who is actually making that call when you say that basic is adequate? I really can't understand it. I'm sorry. And to answer your question, it was the call of the executive leadership team in terms of what, what comes forward to you today. Hmm. So what is the role of the biodiversity advisory group? To and who is that group? Uh, so uh, Patrick um, leads that group and um, and that group is there to advise us um, and myself um, in terms of the what they're seeing in the biodiversity and biosecurity space um, and where the opportunities lie for doing things differently. Just to get a point of clarification, just on the collective impact. So if I look at the current investment, you've got the 22K our model project is part of the collective impact project. And then under basic option, it says no change. Is it no change from that current? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so, so we're not dropping it. Correct. We're just holding the investment in it. So there's already a level effort going into the collective impact project um, through yeah. our existing resource. Um, and under this recommended option, that would stay the same. Yeah. But uh, the point, the connection I wanted to make is in relation to the Natural Heritage Fund, too. So that we know that's being reviewed. But we also know that it hasn't been increased for how many years? It's 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 been static for a, a good number of years, and the the overlay, the connection I want to draw there is between that fund and collective impact. Because actually, if you're not in a position to be directly influencing what you're wanting to achieve regionally, and you're not prepared to increase the fund, even though it's been static for that long, you're essentially losing not just the biodiversity, but the collective impact <laughs> is the point I'm making. Um, and um, yeah, so um, yeah, I just think this needs some a much closer look. And and to me, this contradiction is is extremely worrying because it does seem to be essentially a decision then it sounds like you're essentially doing it on financial grounds. Now, let's also think about the connection and the overlap with Ponga Marino and that project. So where you you've you know you've decided to take some money from resource uh, reserves and invest in that. Where is the scope for doing something more in this space for biodiversity and biosecurity? That's the question I want to pose, and and I'd like to hear some response to that really. 
And and is there is there two parts to that? Is there because uh, I'd like some clarity on um, that natural heritage fund and the level at which that's pitched. Where does that where is that discussed in this? Where is our opportunity as a council to say actually there is a uh, an appetite to test with our community about increasing that? Yeah, could I just add one more thing too? When we last met prior to December, I didn't hear what I've now heard in this document. I did not hear it. I heard lots of support, particularly for biosecurity. And as as, as Councillor Downer, Downer had said, and I heard lots of support for other elements of the biodiversity proposal too. And that's the other bit that I find this a bit of a disjunct here. Yeah, we can make a couple of comments. Um, it, it certainly want, wasn't just about a financial decision in terms of what you see today. Um, it was about balancing. Um, as you can see from the paper that you have before you, there are a number of elements that um, have been presented in this space. Um, and the challenge for uh, myself and the executive was to find that balance um, between making some gains in the right direction um, against um, community affordability. And that's what you see um, before you today. Um, in terms of the discussion around the Natural Heritage Partnership Program, um, so I think at the last long-term plan there was a discussion around it. Yeah, so it was positive and there was a consultation topic um, and it was positively received. So I guess um, if Council was seeking a broader community um, discussion on this matter, then that is an avenue um, that Council may wish to take um, because it is certainly an area that's of quite broad um, community mm. interest. Um, in terms of use of the prior surplus, I mean, um, I know that Janine has spoken previously about the kind of tests um, that are necessary to consider whether that's an appropriate use or not um, around the, the, the source of that funding, um, whether it's a short term or long term commitment, that kind of thing. So. So if we OK, so, yeah, so, so what, what you've got today is um, a lot of uh, permanent increases to the baseline budget. Um, as opposed to necessarily the short term, um, short term initiatives, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And if uh, in the last LTP there was a uh, community appetite for an increase in the natural heritage um, fund, program, fund program. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. that targeted rate, or if I, if I, I'm not sure if I'm getting my words right, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if we if we gauged last three years ago that there was community appetite for that, how would we progress making a change there in this LTP? So at the moment there is an increase um, included in what's put forward to you today. Um, the question becomes timing and scale. So that's within this. Correct. Yeah, that's within this um, business case. Yes, and and presented okay. to you in, the, in terms of the recommended budget. Be help and get Janine to comment. Yeah, can you just help point to focus my eyes uh, on where that's in here? Because I just I'm just trying to test around the table and get you thinking about if there was a desire for a change there. Let's just make sure we're focused on it and that that it's aligned with the appetite. Uh, just so through you, Madam Chair, there is some detail on page uh, 431 and 432 in the green green box on the table in terms of the Natural Heritage Partnership okay. Program. So that's increasing by 50 cents. I got wrong. Are we yep. So through you, Madam Chair, just to clarify that the consultation that we undertook through the last long term plan was in relation to the 2021 version of this business case, but it was around a discussion of council at that time had landed on starting the new investment for this in year two. The consultation was, should we start that sooner in year one? Right. Now the feedback from the community was, yes, start it sooner. Council still stuck with its decision of starting the investment in year two. So that wasn't specifically, I guess, around mm. the Natural Heritage Partnership Program. It was around the business case as a whole. Um, as Greg has probably just highlighted, when I look at the um, consolidated financial statement, so the natural heritage rate 
is projected to go up by about $200,000 a year each year for the first five years of the LTP. So that's probably about the equivalent of a dollar per household in the region. Um, I think one of the other things, and probably where some of the conversation was at pre-Christmas, was um, the report references the Natural Heritage Partnership Programme um, policy review. Um, that work, so the review had been discussed with council and it was acknowledged that there was a need to revise that policy to support additional investment into that space. And we needed some different framing to actually support that additional expenditure. So I think there is still a dependency on having completed that work and getting that um, through council uh, to underpin the increased investment that is being sought, particularly around that natural heritage partnership program. So you're saying that still has to come before council? Yeah, and I think the commitment is that that comes before council before you're actually making a final decision on your LTP. Okay. I'm just looking around, making sure everybody's on board and... All right, thank you. Uh, so I've got Councillor Kneebone, Councillor Nickel, Councillor Dunbar-Smith, Councillor Smith, and Councillor Cookson. Do. Um, no, thanks, Chair. So um, firstly, Greg and Chris, I and ELT, look, I acknowledge the tightrope you've been trying to walk, but I'm really struggling, to be honest, even with the better option here, eh? I mean, we've been bagging the hell out of MPI, and, and for, for good reason, because they haven't been delivering. Um, now they're there for for primary response, for want of a better word, coming with the proper term. We, people view us as the um, the prime agency that manages this stuff, eh? And, and I just don't think we're delivering. And so, couple, I've got a whole bunch of different questions. But the first one, Greg, is why has uh, Natural Heritage Review not been completed yet? Because that was signal quite a few years ago, eh? I mean, I think it was nearly two years ago we sat there and had to send a whole bunch of. We got to. We actually ended up in a situation where we had more good applications that met the criteria than we had money, and we kind of played this any, many, my name, my thing to decide who who should get the money, eh? And and I'm not feeling that we're in any better position now. Yeah. And and to, you also said, oh, the review will be done in due course. You know, I'm feeling a bit like I don't know when that is. Yeah. So, so yeah, two 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 answers. Um, so the the review of the policy was hinging off the wider review that was pre presented to council late last year, um, and so that work has got underway, is underway now, um, anticipating to bring that back to council in April this year, um, and so that will work well in terms of the timing um, with final LTP decisions. I mean, to be honest, I think Janine mentioned one dollar increase per household. That when you think at how much money we've put into supporting the likes of the Lake Taupo cleanup and that sort of thing, and how much terrestrial biodiversity we've got that it's risk, that that's a I mean, people don't even pick that up out of a dollar out of the gutter anymore, you know, eh? So I, I think we need to think really seriously about that. Um and the, the whole thing with collective impact, I look I'll just endorse what, what Bruce said. Eh? I, I think we invited people to, to join this process and it was a really good one and we got heaps of good buy-in and now we're saying, oh, we're not going to do anything. Well, we're the ones that are going to wear that. Um, Department of Conservation, we beg them all the time for not doing their, their job properly, but we're running out of cred to be able to do that. Um, for, from biosecurity perspective, every um, RPMP review that I've sat on two or three, I've lost count now, we've kind of ended up saying, hey, um, this swede's no longer as important as it used to be because another mm -hmm. more pain it's in the ass. It's everywhere and we can't along. do anything so about it. We're just it off the blooming end. And then you can guarantee within a couple of years, a, a, um, a constituent rings up and says, oh, your weed inspector's told me they've got no more power to do anything about that one because why'd you guys tip that off, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and there's a limit to how, how often we can keep doing that. And um, and and I just think that trying to um, be as 
as constrained as we are with rate increases for this part of our business is, is, is really false economy, eh? I, I, I really do, eh? And, and the community are going um, to quite rightly uh, really kick us for it, eh? Can, can I just reinforce um, just your comment on collective impact that um, we do have a level of effort that goes into that program at the moment. Yeah. Um, we have a small amount of operational budget and that won't be changing. Um, there is also an opportunity to use the funding in the NHPP that we have for um, to, to further that work as well. But, but but with respect, though, Greg, I think you said 20 grand or something. That, that's given what we could effectively get from that. That that's nothing, eh? It's mm. it's not even a fifth of an FTE, probably by the time you take the true cost of an FTE into place, you know. Yeah, well, that, that's operational funding. Yeah, but look, I. I Absolutely acknowledge the tensions you've been under, but but I just think I, I want better than the better option, eh? and and I think that I suspect that if we're really honest with our consultation, the community will probably come back and want that as well. So just so I'm clear, if we were to increase the um, what we collect for that, I get the name wrong, the bio or the natural heritage program. Pro partnership program. If we were to increase that, is it limited what we can apply that those funds to, or can we say, or if we increase that, is there opportunity for us to say that actually we feel that um, monitoring is a significant area we would like to see? We think we could make some, you know, better uh, impacts in we could apply that to that or is that fund just strictly for when we partner with externals to do things like pest management or something like that yeah. just want to make sure so so the fund itself is contestable um and it's and it's assessed under our existing policy at the moment um it is funded in two ways um some of it is funded by the natural heritage fund um some of it is part is funded by the uhec um and i guess there's a bit more flexibility in the uhec funding um but um, I know Janine might have a better answer than I could provide. Can, can, can I just can we just check that, Janine? Because we've got a targeted rate that we collect for natural heritage. Um, can you just explain the other funding mechanisms for biodiversity and biosecurity? Uh, yes, so correct. We have a targeted rate for the natural heritage partnerships program, which is set on a uniform basis, so everybody across the region pays the same amount. Um, in addition to that, the biodiversity um, program is funded through the UAGC, which is on everybody pays the same amount across the region. So those two rates, while separate um, from a ratepayer impact, are exactly the same. So everyone's paying on a per household basis. Um, but the fact that the Natural Heritage Partnership Program is a targeted rate, we manage it as such. And so we can carry over um, funding on a year-to-year -year basis. If, if the fund's been um, under-allocated in one year, we can take more applications in the following year. Um, the Biosecurity Program is through a targeted rate on the capital value of all these in the region. Okay, I just think it's really important for councillors to understand because uh, if if we if we want to see increased activity in a particular area, we need to be clear how it is we're funding that, and I want councillors to be very clear on that. So, so we've got the three different areas. We've got the targeted rate for the Natural Heritage Partnership. We've got um, the UAGC is funding the biodiversity, and a targeted rate for biosecurity. Okay. So there's, there, if, if there was appetite to increase, say, our monitoring, then that would be the bios, biosecurity bit that comes from the targeted, there's, I don't know. Um, okay. three, I'm just madam, trying yeah. to get really clear on, for, so that councillors can understand what decisions they're impacting here. I think you're hearing a call that, well, I don't know. I mean, I haven't heard from everybody, but. Through you, Madam yeah. Chair, um, just to note that the monitoring aspect is funded through the general rate, um, through our science program. Huh. 
Okay. I've got just so I've, oh, I've got yeah. Jen, Ben, Noel, Robbie, and Clyde. Madam Chair, just to clarify. So anything that's related to to science, environmental monitoring, policy to do with um, biodiversity, excluding um, RPMP things like that, that comes through the general rate for the spy directorate. So the work that we do in conjunction and partnership with Patrick and you know most ratepayers don't care what directorate you're in, mm. but that is funded through the general rate. So when you're talking about monitoring, if that is responsibilities that Ed's monitoring team would take on, that would be funded by the general rate. And okay. some fees and charges if we were getting technical. All right. I just think it's really important that we get our heads around this because I just taking on board what Councillor Nebone was saying, I you know, I reflect on the last time we did the RPMP and 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 just as as he noted. There were a number of things where it was clear, oh, well, we can't do anything about that. It's too widespread. So, meh. and that that I remember with the panelists, there was not a lot of appetite for that type of scenario to continue. But we need to be clear as a council, what are the things that are that we can do so that doesn't continue to eventuate? So. The, the other little bit I forgot to add to it, do you think of how much riparian planting is going to happen over the next 10 years? We all know what happens the minute you take grazing mouths away from pasture, it just turns into a seed bed of every weed you could ever imagine. Every weed, grade. absolutely, yeah. That's what's going to be happening, eh? Yeah. All right. Okay, so I, I don't know if everybody's got it. I am certain that I don't have it. So anything we can be doing, to help ensure the picture is clear for us when it comes to making this decision, that would be really helpful. All right, I've got Councillor Nickel, Jen. Thanks, I'm back track. Um, I just wanna point out, I'm not coming at this from an ideological point of view, I don't feel. Um, I'll give you some numbers. Uh, just as an example, the Wilding Pines piece that we are proposing to do less than enough on, had in their um, feedback, and it was in the news recently, independent economic analysis estimates an overall benefit cost ratio of between 20 to 1 and 34 to 1 for every dollar invested in controlling wilding infestations and preventing the spread. You know, that's pretty good stuff. In some of our text, we say economic development will be undermined by environmental degradation. That's taken straight out of the non-financial assumptions we've had before. And then thirdly, I had found in my extensive reading on page 434 that almost all projects funded through the Natural Heritage Partnership Program leverage other sources of funding and or volunteers who provide in-kind support. The estimated return on investment for EIF is around 400%. This means overall EIF recipients were funded 20% of their total project cost by WRC, meaning WRC's investment was able to leverage a further 80% of funding the Natural Heritage Fund, the larger fund, has similar figures with a return of investment of 307%, with recipients also able to leverage a further 75% of funding. It's it's one of, and I thank you for those numbers because I've been waiting for them. Wow, it's the first time I've seen them in four years. But um, this is a part where we do get leverage that we often talk about trying to get more of. So to me, boosting something like the Natural Heritage Partnership Programme targeted rate seems like an obvious way to get more impact. Um, I think we should ask the community how much they're willing to pay. I had a look before in the Reserve Bank inflation calculator, first time I've ever used that in my life. I'm sure it's not the first for the others. But in 2005, $5.80 would now be, if we had inflation um, applied to it, $9.14. So I think if we went out to the community and said, would you be willing to get this back up to where it once was, would you like to do a bit more even, like $15 or something, or $12, whatever it might be? I'm sure you could work it out based on the oversubscription of the fund, of what would be sensible. I'm thinking it would probably land somewhere, um, rather than the 100,000 or 200,000 that's mentioned in here, to say 500,000 or a million extra, since I think it says oversubscribed by 1.8 million. Not all of those are going to be quality projects, but I'm sure your team does know. So with, let's trust the community to tell us how much they're willing to pay for this biodiversity stuff. That would 
is a question I think we should go out with. I had raised in workshops a different question, but I'm probably not going to pursue it because we've got enough other things to talk about right now. But I think we should look at it again in future as to how it's funded, um, because there is a disproportionate amount of impact um, based on uh, the lifestyles of those with a higher income, a higher capital value to those on lower. And so that same amount per property, I feel like should get questioned, but like I said, let's leave it. I just want to put on record that I've raised it. Um, and I do wonder with this operating surplus that we have, whether there is another short term project in there somewhere to have a look at this MPI giving us a hospital pass over and over again. And now we've got Kalerpa and now we've got the clams and maybe something working with the regional sector, but solving this issue of just getting set up to fail and getting set up to basically have to ask our ratepayers for more money all the time because we didn't get the incursions early. Is there something we can do locally on the ground, funded by them or for them or with them, that, that kind of needs sorting? Uh, we all know that. So I want to put that forward just as a suggestion because it keeps coming up. And when you've got other articles coming out like, was it? Chilean needle grass, one billion threat to our economy type of stuff. It just seems like this whole category is the cost of not doing things doesn't get mentioned nearly enough. There's a lot of costs for trying to keep down doing things, but it's just going to get more expensive otherwise. So, um, And you don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah, so a question on how much they'd be willing to pay for um, Natural Heritage Program, thanks to the great returns. Um, on investment and a question on biosecurity would be really good, I think, because we're talking about it out there. People know these incursions are coming in. Do they want us to do better? I bet you the response would be yes. And But we just need a guide as council of how much more the community is willing to tolerate at this point in time. And I'm happy to trust them to tell us that. Ben. Ben, Um. I think the EMT have done a good job here and they've been getting undue criticism um, because we're acting as though nothing is being proposed. We're actually looking at 1.5 million by year three and six extra staff. So it's not like nothing is happening at all. What if, if we go back to the very beginning of this document asking about how people's income were, 32% of households says they don't have enough income or only just enough. This is the area that we're living in. And I think if you're going to look at the better option here, it's a difference between 16 million and 39 million. It's at least a 1% rate increase additional. So uh, all, by all means, go ahead and ask people, do they want to pay another 1% on their rates? And it goes from 6.8 to 7.8. I don't think you'll get that answer. I think there is a mechanism here. It's not as though we're not doing anything. And in fact, when we looked at the Natural Heritage Fund, it is increasing um, year on year. Perhaps it wasn't easily understood. Um, Biodiversity's got extra staff. We're doing work on carry protection. We're doing work on limited um, wilding pines. So I'm just... I, I'm saying go and ask the people if they want it, but we need to explain to them it's another 1% on the rates. Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, I'm going to disagree with you, Ben, because um, I do believe that ELT was having, I'm really impressed with what's been produced for us today, but misread the sentiment in the room when we did our dots on the wall and whatever, there was overwhelming support for this area of the business. Uh, to the extent that uh, I think we should be looking at the higher option uh, because, yeah, I look back and this organisation was what's called Environment Waikato. Um, it would have probably been better to have stayed that way um, because it's so much about the environment here. Um, but anyway, I think that we need to see the costs and I'm going to ask that this matter is carried over till tomorrow or, or the next day so that we can see what Ben's just alluded to the 39. I just want that validated. 
I, I, to not do what we should do. It's one of those scenarios, damned if you do and damned if you don't. But I would rather be kicked out of here if I stand the next time for doing the right thing than doing the wrong thing. And to me, doing what's proposed is the wrong thing. It's not enough. Uh, and I would rather see something else cut from this budget than this area of business. So I would, and, and I to go back to something that Jen said, I too worked it out and, and I got it rounded out to $10 with the inflation at 3% per annum over 20 years. That's only to get back to where we were 20 years ago. Uh, at ten dollars, um, it's four dollars uh, twenty increase, a matter of eight cents per week, and I know eight cents on top of eight cents on top of is compounding and, and adds to costs and, and rates. But I'd rather see two issues here. We hold this if we need to, unless the, the, the we've got sufficient information, and we may have. The preferred option is not the basic option, but the better option. Uh, and would like to see some honed in conversation on these two points as to whether there's appetite to increase the natural heritage back to where it should be with inflation uh, or, or higher. And secondly, to do the right thing in this space and go for the better option. Because mm. um, I've listened and I've listened, but I don't think we've, and I think Bruce threw that challenge down to us right at the start, and we've talked around the issue. Um, it's time to actually put our money where our mouth is and say which way we want to go, because otherwise we just can't have a talk first. Thank you. I think that there is a need for staff to do a little bit more work on how we might option air. Is that a word? This, you know, I, it feels to me like there's a mix of 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 rating devices and and uh, and different options. And councillors are just wanting a little bit more uh, clarity on the implications. All right. Did you want to make a comment? I see you've got a red light on there. Uh, other than absolutely. Yeah. Yes, we okay. do have those figures to hand. So. All right. Okay. I've got uh, Councillor Clipson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have some um, some fee for what Noel was saying, but for myself then the heritage fund I think should be broken up into catchments and whatever you're paying in that catchment, you should get to keep that, that you, that should be able to be used in your catchment. Because otherwise we've just feel like the poor cousin over there in the Waihau again, and the catchment will go to whoever the greatest gets the greatest ideas and our iwi and our catchment will be suffering again. So I, I, I think, the the way that fund works has to be totally pulled apart and reassessed that the catchment money that is in there stays within the catchment and and then those in the catchment if they want to have a higher targeted rate for it they also can because their money stays in their catchment my opinion sorry is that just a point of clarification for councillor cookson Oh, oh, yeah, there's I've got Councillor Graff, Councillor Clarkson, Councillor Marr, and then I'll add you to the end. All right. Councillor Graff. Thanks. Were, sorry, were you done? That's yeah, fine. If, I, if someone wants to reply back to it, I'd quite welcome to listen. Yeah. So the um, currently built into the plan is is the um, basic option. Is that right? What difference will the um, better option impact will that have? Uh, sorry, could you repeat your question? Yeah, so, sorry, Councillor Graf, I've just asked um, Janine that exact question oh, sorry. to Did try you? and see if we can work out oh, what the okay. cumulative yeah. impact of doing because a better option. We're, we're sort of asking, suggesting more money should be put into this, and my worry is where does that money go? Where is it going to? What what area is it being directed into? If it's biosecurity, um, that sounds like everyone's interested in biosecurity and needs to be done. If it was, bio, if it was um, biodiversity and monitoring, Ten years ago, I asked for monitoring, you know, and aerial operations and things like that because they're going on big scale um, pest control operations, and it was claimed that um, 
it was a great success because it killed possums, but there was no monitoring on what the what, what impact it had on wildlife. And here we are 10 years later, and we're still seeing the same problem with the wildlife in decline. Interestingly, I've just put through an OIA a little while ago, but to do with Kiwi in Northland, and of the birds tested, 50 odd birds tested for poison, 37% of them were positive for poison, 37% of Kiwi. Now, Kiwi are omnivorous. In an aerial operation, uh, EPA just re released its report um, for the last year's aerial operations, and uh, 556 gulls were killed, back black gulls in the uh, west coast. It's non-target stuff that's getting killed, and I've been saying it for years, and we've still got no monitoring. There's no monitoring going on and just what the impacts are. Um, but just to throw more money into the kitty, I worry about that because I worry it's going to be used on more poison, aerial operations, which I can't, I don't support and that doesn't matter. But the thing is, I think we have to be very clear where the money's going, where the interest is, um, and then we can all support it or not support it. But uh, I think that's where I am on that. Thank you very much. Oh, I'd just like to add while I'm at it. <laughs> I'd like to see if, if we could have some policy around our pest control um, because we're currently third world in the way we uh, treat our wildlife, uh, introduced species and humans. <laughs> we drop that deadly poison directly into people's waterways, um, often not even informing that it's been done. And then we're using the same poison to kill introduced species. Um, and it's inhumane, and I think it reflects badly on us if we want to talk about how we look to the world and to our communities. So thank you for listening. And if I might. Oh, sorry, oh, sorry. Um, through you, Madam Chair. That, um, I think if you, your question in terms of the what, pages 429 to 32 probably give an indication of what's in that biosecurity part. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking that in terms of... Um, where the discussion's going, and I, I'm just wondering um, if you're able to probably get some confirmation. What I'm hearing is there's at least some who would like to know what the impact of having a the, the next data start of the preferred, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, of the, the better option, a better option um, of what that would be and how that would fall and from how, a rating sense. Yes. Is, yeah. is that possible to get that all done tonight, Janine? Uh, probably the team over there that need to, um, I think, for each of those work programs, uh, work out the costing difference between what's in the business case and the better option. And then against each of those lines, we should be able to identify the funding source. So through you, Madam Chair, we already have, have that information okay. together, so I guess just translating Fantastic. it into the different funding streams. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. It just allows us to to tailor, I suppose, and make sure that we're adjusting the right things to get the outcomes that we that we collectively want. So. Okay. What do we got next? Uh, Councillor Clarkson. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Look, um, yes, Ben, I do understand that there is an increased investment. I absolutely understand that. But the concern that I raised initially really was around the rationale of what we were being presented with. We were being told that we needed the better then we were told we were going to get the basic, and then we were told actually the basic was probably something to do with the better. I, I mean, honestly, there was a complete lack of rationale. And the, um, the course of action being proposed by our chair and others has clarified a, a, a way to get to a, some the mid possibly. But, but the point is, it needs to be rational. It needs to be done properly, and it needs to surely you don't go from all basic, I mean, all better to all basic. I can't I can't get that, you know. Surely there weren't some things in there that were in the better category that could have been held on to. This yeah. is the point, well, I that's, think. That's what I'm keen for us to be able to. And that's confirm. what I would really like to see. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we need to make sure that we finish up early enough today to give time to staff to, to, mm -hmm. to put some thinking around yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> so. uh, not yet. Not yet. Okay, but I'm just wondering. Um, okay, I've got Councillor Mar and Councillor Mahuta, but I'm I'm just flagging for councillors that you hear the what we're asking staff to do overnight, 
if if your questions are in addition, then cool. But let's if, if we the sooner we can move on, that'd be great. Hmm? Uh, I'm sure that you'll you've got it. And that and that 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 is part of our decision making process here. Council yeah, Mark. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, yeah, just adding my voice to we've seen the state of the environment report. We've seen the state of the Gulf report. Um, we've talked around workshops. Biosecurity and biodiversity is hugely important. The Coromandel has been a benefit of a lot of the Natural Heritage Fund, um, but it's also it's it's showing our communities um, and the feedback I get is is that there's so many good people, community people on the ground, basically doing our work for us. And they're more than happy to be doing it, and we just need to be seen to be supporting them as much as we can. So, um, whatever funding mechanism that that takes to increase that natural heritage fund, I'm all behind. I'd ra I'd rather see no rolling stock and more money in that. I'd rather see no Tawaka and more money in that. So that's my two cents. Ooh. Just to, just getting bold. Yes. Very quickly. Um, I was just cogitating on the numbers around the if we had um increased the the natural heritage rate as we as we should have. It's quite a big jump. Just just to throw into the mix, Janine, that there's also a, I'm I'm not saying we should or we shouldn't, but I think we should consider the the op, the option of using perhaps some of the investment fund return just to help recorrect it rather than rely on it permanently. I, I, I don't know, but it's it's worth I think it's worth looking at. It might be a silly one, but but I'm not saying to be an answer now, but something to look at. Uh Councillor Mahuta. I just wanted to note um, and to um, the points brought up about the other catchments. Um, when I started here, it was noted that the Waikato River settlement caused a whole heap of the energy given to the Waikato River um, because it provided another partner and another source of funding in a legislative framework. So, um, that's some 12 years ago. In that time, the Hauraki settlement was an idea. It's likely to land in the next two years. So I would like to that view, there'll be another environmental investor in that locality and what, what are our potential options to partner with. Um, and likewise with other parts of the catchment that have since been settled. But to the other councillors, since I've been here, probably Taupo Coromandel have been the major beneficiaries of the well, yes and no, but there were drivers to support support that work. Um, the West Coast feels equally a grief uh, for the lack of attention, and if Fred was here, he would have said that. But again, just to, to our knowledge, the West Coast is a, is a claim by Waikato, and that will go through in the next three years too. So just note that while we're the core, it's our core responsibility, there are other people with as much interest in those areas, and I just wouldn't want us to not have that in mind. Now, they're not settlements till they are, but within these three years, we might have to apply some flexibility if there's new opportunities. So saying that, and I do support what you said, there are catchments that have um, gone poorly. So it's kind of, how do we tell that timed out story about the last thing we invested in in the area? Because while I'm in the Waikare Whangamarino area, it's the only thing invested in locally to me. So I, I shared the sentiment to the, to the council. Councillor Nicol. Oh, yeah, I just remembered I did have a constituent get in touch with me as well um, who were quite concerned about um, merging pollutants. And when I had a chat with um, Brent, it seems that we have very little ways of tackling those with the way that the RMAs works. And um, so I would like to appeal for potentially a short-term project, um, some of the surplus or, or something else in this. I'm re mentioning it now because of the monitoring aspect of this business case. Um, really concerned about microplastics in particular, and there's new methods out currently, uh, recently, about nanoplastics. Um, forever chemicals, PFAS and stuff has been coming up over e EPC for a few years now, and a new one we haven't dis um, discussed much yet, but is part of the same ecosystem-breaking planetary boundary type science, um, which is endocrine disruptors. Just would be really interesting to see if staff could come up with something to have a look at how we could get on the front foot to then perhaps have a good conversation with EPA to do what they need to do to um, get us working in that space. And the other one was, as I've mentioned in the workshops a few times, soil biology. 
Um, I think for the Waikato, we should know a lot more about our soil biology. It's really relevant to the agricultural side of things and and just simply because there's so much biology in the soil and I think we don't know enough about it. I thank you for that. And um, I think in that review for the Natural Heritage Program, we should look at the thing that Robbie mentioned about uh, at least finding a way to make that quite fair. Thank you. Oh, just on that one, Robbie, um, absolutely open to looking to better even up the distribution of the fund, but I think we should think very carefully about whether we go into, into catchment-based funding scenarios because the, the problem is that areas that have the most um, weed and pest incursions or risks are not necessary catchments that have high rating income. So, so um, and then just finally, mm -hmm. Hamilton City contributes a lion's share of our biosecurity rate. The lion's share of the spending happens outside of Hamilton because that's where all the challenges are, eh? Mm. Um, and and Hamilton City mm. and City and Tonians, whatever you want to call them, utilise a lot of those areas as well. So just need to be quite careful about how we go about that, eh? All right. Okay. You all have your overnight writing instructions. Uh, yeah. Um, well, we're not making any decisions as we're going through. But yes, that we're asking for more information tomorrow. So we'll come back to it. Okay, just testing with the crowd uh, because we've got um, about a quarter of an hour. Do we want to do one, try one more? Yeah. yeah. Oh, look at the, oh. which Which do you think is least controversial? Well, I don't know. We, I was hoping to get, I was hoping to get through the next two, which were the um, coastal and marine strategic priority and the maritime services. Which one would you, I'm looking around the table, which one would you like to try? Maritime services? Okay. Sorry, Madam Chair, so can these two gentlemen be excused till tomorrow? Yes. Because they are the other two business cases. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. We'll see you again tomorrow. All right. Do we have the maritime services people in the room? Is it just Brent? You don't have any any comrades? You don't have any partners in crime? I, I'm, I've moved ahead to page 43. This is the increased capacity for maritime services. Item 14.6, page 487 for the, um, for the business case. Yeah, that's why I'm hoping we'll finish quickly. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. I think we had this conversation in a little bit of detail at the last workshop um, where I think Chris, our Deputy Harbour Master, might have commented that he um, he compromised a bit in terms of the things that he really felt they needed in terms of building the capacity of, of the maritime services um, part of our business. Um, I know there was a few councillors that were interested in whether or not we'd gone far enough. Um, and I think the response I gave was we recognise the fiscal position that we're in as, as a council. And so we're looking at a, a bit of a slow ramp. And so we've seen the business case is what we, what we talked about before, not increasing to the additional four that the hub master was looking for, but having an additional one staff member next year, an additional one staff member the following year to be able to meet the growing demand on our, of keeping people safe on our waterways, and um, whilst being able to meet our health and safety obligations around being two up in vessels. Um, we sold our conversations around the sides of the table and just power through this, um, right? And, and, the, and then the, the capital side was just around the the, the costs that councillors who are working in the marine space will know around boats and engines to be able to continue to be able to deliver the service. Um, and so um, I'll stop there because there's nothing new here from what we had that detailed conversation at, at the workshop. All right, health and safety. Yep. Uh, Councillor uh, Dunbar-Smith. Yeah, yeah, I just had a question. It says here to meet the minimum crewing requirements. How have they been meeting them up till now if they're not been meeting the minimum? We, so, and sometimes we have volunteers, 
Um, I think uh, at times there have been one person on a boat or somebody else dragged into working on a boat to be able to do the maintenance work that we need to do. Um, but the um, uh, we've been sailing close to the wind, councillor. Let's put it that way. Uh, and to make sure that our people are fully safe on all the activities on the water, we need to have two people on those vessels, and particularly when people are uh, leaning over the side to do things like um, uh, picking up um, navigation aids. And I think example that um, Councillor Ma might talk about from our boating fr friend who fell off his boat um, is in a classic example around the knees for having two people on vessels. Right, uh, yeah, Councillor yeah. Mar. Look, just add, adding to that, um, I saw a number of times in our harbour that um, we needed a harbour master out there to get round round the boaties that are uh, generally completely ignorant of the rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Stu was on his own out of Hikawai there, so uh, there was even the case there were boats harassing orcas up our harbour. I gave Stu a ring. He turned up. He didn't have a vessel available. Ended up our club captain took him out in his boat. So um, certainly support this and and um, what have supported for so. It's, a, it's something we've been under invested in and it's something we need to, it, it's an area of responsibility and we all know Maritime just has suffered um, recently. Cheers. Uh, Councillor Nebon. Yeah, thanks Brett. Um, look, really supportive and look, acknowledging I read this particular one quite quickly because I'm um, a bit of a no brainer, but uh, are we covering, putting a bit of this resource into the lakes as well? Yeah, so the, we've, um, over the next two years, there's one roll this year, one roll next year. Yeah. The, the Sorry, next year and the year after. The first roll will be based um, over in the, um, basically over in the Coromandel, and the second roll will be more focused over here. But the people go backwards and forwards as, yeah. as pressures apply. Um, you'll appreciate the pressures right now in our lakes is a little bit different because of the clam issue. You, uh, we're impacted as, as anybody about where our boats can go um, because they can't go upstream. And so um, that is a bit of additional pressure in terms of we can bring us a, a boat that's being in the salt water across to an, an upper lake um, and then back to the salt water, but you can't be moving boats up. Um, so that puts a little bit of operational pressure on as well. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. Thank you for raising that with us. All right. Anything else? Nope. Support there. Okay. All right, everybody. We're going to um, uh, close it with that. Oh, one more. You've got, you've got to adjourn it, don't you? I, I, I will adjourn it. I just am just, yep. Okay. So when we uh, come back tomorrow, we, I think what we'll do is continue through the business cases. I'm um, starting with the the coastal and marine strategic priority, skipping over the maritime services, and then going on from there. And then once we've gotten through all the rest of the business cases, we'll come back to that biodiversity biosecurity one to get the further information we've requested today. Okay, great. All right, so we'll close today uh, with a katakia, and then we'll adjourn the meeting till tomorrow. Yeah. Me to do it. Onahia, onahia, onahia mai te uru tapanui, ki a watea, ki a mama, te nako, te tinana, te heninaro, e te ara takatu, koera e rongo, e faka kara e rio, a kararia, aki keronga, ki a tina, tina, humi, homie, huie, tai ki e. All right, so the meeting is adjourned at 2.50. We will reconvene tomorrow morning at 9.30. Thank you, everyone.